right there. We're good. Okay, I'd like to uh, start the uh, town council meeting for Monday, January 6th. If uh, Councilwoman Bello would lead us in uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dolores, can you uh, take attendance for us, please? Councilor Moore and Bello. Here. Councilor Flanagan. Here. Councilor Flores. Here. Councilor Hill. Here. Councilor Mazzarella. Here. Councilor Parker. Here. Councilor Penelo. Here. And Mayor Rell. Here. Thank you, Dolores. Mm -hmm. um, before we begin, uh, um, we have a presentation from the uh, Health District. I don't know, Charlie and Pat, are you guys going to both go up? Or? Yeah, we're going to tag team this. Okay, <laughs> great. I figure if you have as much experience as I do on my board, you use it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just like to say thank you for having us here. Um, this is our annual update for our member town, so we're going to go through uh, a lot of information today, but we're going to do it hyper speed very quickly. So I'm going to talk about light speed <laughs> for a southerner, okay? So what do we do as a health district? Um, generally, we prevent, promote, and protect things. Um, so myself and Dr. Pat Checo, who's our uh, chairman of the board of health, are going to go through a lot of information for you today. Some general information about CCHD for those of you who haven't seen this before, or actually one thing we're missing is the presentation. That might be good if we can get the slide. Uh, <laughs> Yes, we can see I, I looked up, I could see it down here. I looked up and I realized that nobody else could see the presentation. That might be a, a hindrance. <laughs> well, I know you guys have good imagination. We should be good to go. No, no remote. And we didn't bring the other copies for sure. They do have copies. Oh, they do have copies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, rewind. We're going to try that again. Technology is great when it works. All right. okay, that. <laughs> yes. We tested it. Oh, there we go. Is that better, guys? Okay, so let's try this again. <laughs> it's coming up. It's coming up. Okay, so our 2019-2020 annual update for our towns. Um, as I said, my name is Charles Brown. I'm the Director of Health. Uh, this is Dr. Pat Checo, who's our Chairman of our Board of Health. Um, some general information about the Health District. Uh, we cover the towns of Berlin, Newington, Rocky Hill, and Wethersfield, and we serve a combined population of about 97,000 people. Uh, the district itself was founded 24 years ago in 1996, and we provide a broad range of services to all of our member towns. I understand a number of you are new to the council this year and may know a little about what a health district is, except they're the guys who go to restaurants. Uh, so we'll tell you really quickly about um, what a district is and uh, at the same time how we raise our money. Uh, we are one of 20 regional public health departments in the state of Connecticut. Uh, you can see us blocked off there um, in, are we yellow or blue on yours? In blue in the middle. Blue in the middle, okay. Right in the central. And um, these were founded by statute approximately um, 50 or 55 years ago. And in the wisdom of the legislature and uh, to help out public health, it was an opportunity for particularly smaller towns to come together and use efficiency of size to be able to provide the mandated public health services uh, to their specific towns. And um, so in the case of Wethersfield, yes, I am old enough to remember Dr. Foote. We used to call him Father Foote when he was at the health department at the state where I worked. And um, at that time you had, it was not unusual to have a part-time health director like Dr. Foote 
and one full-time sanitarian uh, like our former director of health, and Paul Hutchins. Um, and so that worked until 1996 when you were, along with Rocky Hill, the founding members of the Central Connecticut Health District. Uh, and what that actually does is it helps you to provide the mandated public health service and the ones that aren't mandated that we all have to respond to, like the opioid crisis and uh, now things like hoarding. And so uh, I just want to give you an idea if, if you had to do this on your own, what it might cost you. So first you'd have to have someone who could be qualified by the state as a full-time health director. Um, that means they'd have to have a minimum of an MPH um, some of us have more, some of us have less, but that's your minimum. And your starting salaries, depending on what part of the state you're in, um, might be anywhere from probably 80 to over 100. Then you would be required to have a full-time sanitarian to take care of those mandated inspections like the, the restaurant licensure, the septic systems, many of which are gone, but I'm sure you still have breakthroughs, your water supply, um, and those other things that are remembered as the environmental issues. And right now, to have someone who is called a registered sanitarian, which means they have a national certification in the science of environmental health, again, is going to cost you anywhere from 60 to um, Depending on their experience and their value, they could go up into the 80s or 90s uh, themselves. So there's your two staff, and of course, then you've got to add in your administrative staff, um, your benefits for your employees, um, your supplies, et cetera, et cetera. So if you were to take a pad and scribble that out, you would probably find yourself well above, hopefully, <laughs> not hopefully, I know you are, um, above the $6.25 a head that we uh, charge for the services that we provide for everyone. And, and that was the whole name of the game, um, that the people receive the services they deserve and should have, uh, and it costs the town itself much less. Some of our districts are as small as Two towns, my former health district where I worked was the city of, of Bristol and the town of, of Burlington, pretty different. <laughs> um, and there are some that are as large as 12 and 13, places like Farmington Valley and the Torrington area health district. So because we, um, because we are regional health districts, we do have budgets, and we have to figure out what our fees are for you each year. Tali will talk uh, more about the revenues, et cetera, but clearly there is a real budget process with accountability, uh, with auditors that come in every year and take a look at us. Um, and uh, right now, we've been doing well for you, we hope, and spending your money cautiously and wisely. Oh, okay. So it is a whole year now that we have been in the new offices in Rocky Hill. I'm pleased to report that it has had the effect we had hoped. There's much more cohesion in the office with the staff. They are learning to really work together as a team instead of thinking of themselves as people in different health departments in different towns. We're getting a lot of cross-training. And the most important thing, um, other than the fact that we think we're more effective and efficient, is we have had no complaints from our constituents, either you guys at this level or are the community themselves. So we're, we're very pleased with that. Um, we have 11 employees, nine of whom are full-time. We have over 50 active participants and lay volunteers 
who work not only in our flu clinics and prepare themselves for an emergency if we had it, uh, but also in our opioid program that you're gonna hear a lot more about, and uh, two of the people on your board are quite active in that. So we have a 14-member board, and I'd like to take a minute to introduce yours to you again, if you're not familiar with them. We're very, very thrilled with the people you have sent to us. Uh, they are not only interested and involved, but they bring a great deal of experience. So first up is uh, Deb Hanal. Stand please, Deb. <laughs> um, Deb comes with a great experience from the Department of Corrections and many years in substance abuse work. We are delighted to have her. And to make you sleep better, she actually serves as the chairman of the Finance Committee. You could also take your wrath out on her if you have any. <laughs> Please. Uh, Next up is Anne-Marie DiLoretto. Anne-Marie, please. Uh, Anne-Marie is a psych nurse, uh, and she <coughs> is also very involved in the opioid uh, volunteers and serves along with the two of us on uh, the recovery committee that's uh, very involved with working with families, et cetera. And then our newest member is Jen Hill. Uh, she may be familiar to you. <laughs> and uh, Jen comes to us with experience in uh, school-based health centers, and uh, she is a school nurse and, of course, a mother. And she's serving on our immunization work group uh, that's going to be taking a close look over this year at the role of local health and immunization all the way from flu clinics to education to should we take a bigger role. So thank you all again for them and we look forward to continuing to work with them. So I get to s jump in and start talking about the bottom line. Uh, as Pat mentioned, uh, the health district is funded by a variety of ways. And last year, uh, our audited revenues came in a little bit over a million dollars. Uh, as she had mentioned, our per capita charge per person per year is $6.25. Um, so we brought in a little bit over $583,000 uh, from our town contributions. Uh, in addition to that, we have program revenue. Uh, this is the type of fees that we pay for inspection services, for um, plane reviews, things of that nature. Brought in about $266,000 there. Uh, grants from the federal, state, and others. Uh, we have actually brought in about $319,000 last year and some interest income just over, just about $4,000. Our expenditures, as you might expect, uh, because we don't make widgets, uh, most of our expenses are really personnel related. So uh, salaries, uh, employee benefits make up the lion's share of what we spend our money on. Uh, we have professional staff and uh, we make sure that, we, that we're trying to keep them. Uh, we also have some professional and contractual expenses Operating expenses at about 184,000, and then other other expenses about 23. So all told, our expenses came in a little bit uh, under our revenue, which is exactly how we like to keep it. Okay, so moving on to uh, the meat. Uh, just a minute, because several of you are new to this. Um, Council and may not know a lot about public health. I just want to spend a minute or two talking about that. So, how are we different from health care? Um, we, in fact, are really part of a spectrum of health. You got prevention down this side, and it moves up to what we're all used to is sick care, kicking in when you're sick, never really concerned with the prevention side of things, and then, of course, um, tertiary care. So the primary focus of healthcare is seeing people one at a time, being the individual level for the 15 minutes you are allowed in the office visit. <laughs> um, but the job of public health is the population as a whole. So while we care about you as an individual, particularly if you have a disease and we're trying to help you deal with that or follow up on it, we really care about the population as a whole. And I like to say that 
doctors take care of patients one at a time. We take care of all the people all of the time. Um, I'm going to use <coughs> as an example uh, measles, one because it's just a good example and one because it's uh, so much in the news. Um, so when it comes to vaccinations and immunizations themselves, that's clearly a public health initiative. It's something that public health has led since uh, the inception of vaccines as a community intervention to prevent um, primarily childhood diseases, but other immunizable diseases. The role of the uh, practitioner at that level is really to be the one who is going to hopefully, uh, the pediatricians mostly and our uh, federal community health centers, uh, to be taking care of the little ones, uh, encouraging and get vaccination and vaccinating our kids. Um, a lot of people, and I think Mike Rell knows where the vaccines come from, but the rest of you may not know, that the state of Connecticut has a huge vaccine fund. And that actually all those vaccines our kids get, uh, and there are more and more added every year, are paid for by the state of Connecticut. And what you are paying when you pay a bill to the doctor is actually a uh, vaccine administration fee. So right now under the law, all the doctors, unless they wanna buy their own, I guess, are required to be part of the Department of Public Health's immunization program. Uh, they get all their vaccines through that department uh, and they are continue to be supported by the state and in some cases the CDC. So what happens when a case actually occurs? First of all, the doctor totally panics because the last thing he wants in his office is a kid with measles. But that's the place the diagnosis usually will get made. Uh, there's not a whole lot of treatment, as you know, so uh, they take care of the child and then they're going to run to tell us and worry about anybody who may have been exposed in their office. What we then are going to do when a measles case occurs is first do assessment around who may have been exposed, who is at risk, um, whether the child probably needs to be asked to stay at home until they uh, have no rash. Uh, and then we will also uh, look at various policies, that is um, looking at who may not have been vaccinated, who has been exposed, knowing full well that the vaccine probably won't take in the 18 days, uh, but making that available. And also identifying anybody who has been at risk and letting them know. And then watching them for the full 18 day period to see if we have more cases Unfortunately, if more cases occur, then a whole lot of other things would kick in uh, that I don't want to get into, but it would become a much bigger situation. <coughs> and um, so the process then becomes for the healthcare provider, the management, uh, the patient care. In this care case, it would be mom doing the patient care primarily uh, because usually people don't get sick, but they may get hospitalized. And uh, on our end, we would be doing systems management. Uh, that is certainly what something like a vaccine program is really all about. And then certainly the outcome at the end would be to return that individual to good health and, to, um, and for us to have overall healthy community. So getting back to why did we create these things called public health agencies? Clearly part of our job is to prevent epidemics and the spread of disease, to protect people against environmental hazards, to prevent injuries, which have become more and more part of what we do that we didn't before, well, with elderly and aging injuries, um, with substance abuse and injuries, uh, with all the things that are out there. Uh, promoting and encouraging healthy behaviors because that's what we need to prevent disease. Responding to disasters and assisting communities in their recovery. And finally, assuring the quality and accessibility of healthcare services. 
So preventing epidemics and spread of disease, um, sometimes that's done directly, sometimes indirectly. One of the most direct things we do, obviously, are our influenza clinics each year. This year, we purchased 2,400 doses and ran out early, and people were very upset with us. Um, but uh, this is something that many of the local health departments have been doing for years. Uh, I like to look at this as we did a great job marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and educating people that th this isn't anything to just wink at. Um, we've got it down to such a science that the average time is under three minutes to get in and get out with your shot. I don't even think CVS could do as well. Uh, we also are responsible for the infectious disease reporting that affects people in our community. Some of the diseases, the list is about 75 long, but some of the things you're more likely to be aware of are things like hepatitis A and B and C, the good old salmonella that visits us every so often, lead poisoning in children, which is still out there. You know, we tend to think that lead's gone in gas and it used to be the biggest problem, uh, but now we still have old buildings. Uh, I live in a 300-year-old house, and there was certainly lead-based paint in our house when we moved in. Uh, we also have other sources that people are not aware of, and I think last year Charlie talked about cases in one of our minority communities uh, where the poisoning was directly related to uh, pressure cookers and lead that was in the pressure cookers. We also have it in things like jewelry, and it's out there in spices, homemade remedies. So uh, it's one of those things we don't think about very much. And from the perspective of legal issues, it can be one of our most costly, because sometimes we have to take people to court because things are involved that cost money. Um, and. Um, Sometimes families have to be moved and brought into safe housing. Also, the vaccine preventable diseases and another thing that we're seeing a lot more often and the public needs to become more aware of is this thing called Legionella. You may remember it, part of you, most of you are not even old enough to remember an uh, outbreak in Pennsylvania of some old legionnaires several years back. Um, and from that, we got Legionnaire's disease. What the public doesn't really know about that particular uh, organism is it likes to grow in water. And we're going to really have to do a better job at really trying to explain to people that it may be in your water supply, but not freaking them out. So uh, uh, it, it, it is a some, a something of an environmental concern that would be more important in the future. The other place we, uh, I want to spend some time this year is the issue of vector-borne diseases uh, and why they are important to us. Uh, again, some of you are old enough to remember back in about 1976 or 7 uh, when we discovered a brand new disease in Connecticut and it's called Lyme disease because it was found in Lyme. This was really unusual at that time. It was very rare for us to see something, maybe a rare case of Rocky Mountain spe spotted fever. But now we've come to know, if not love, Lyme disease. And along with it, these little ticks can also spread a number of other bacterial infections that are rare but serious called Ehrlichiosis, Babesiosis, and Anaplasmosis. Uh, with mosquitoes, we didn't worry too much in Connecticut, mostly. Uh, most people don't realize that probably for over 50 years, we've been watching mosquitoes down the shoreline because there's a pocket down there. It's always been there with eastern equine encephalitis right across the border in Massachusetts. Uh, but it really wasn't until fairly recently this year uh, that we saw cases of our own. And then the other new thing on the block, maybe 15 years ago, was West Nile virus. Uh, some of you may remember crows dropping dead in your yard. I remember people bringing them into my office so we could identify them and test them. 
So we've come to live with these things and begin to understand um, more about them and the fact that they are here. So what this is, is taking a look at our four towns and our experience with tick-borne diseases um, in the past year. So you can see that we had 40 cases of Lyme disease. Uh, and remember, this is our own endemic disease. It's out there, people need to understand. It's in your backyard, it's in my backyard. Uh, so we need personal protection and taking those personal protections. But there's also a lot of information and pamphlets out there that will help people do things in their yard to kind of tick-proof them, uh, keeping your shrubs, etc., cetera, uh, cut. We also had six cases of babesiosis and six cases of this unusual one called anaplasmosis. So we have had 52 different cases of these vector-borne diseases in our four towns. It's in all four towns. You can see the age range is four to 89 years old. So we are all at risk and uh, we need to become much more aware of them. The other reason I, I wanted to put this up, and let me talk about mosquitoes for a second before I talk about climate change. Um, because we had the EEE this year and because people were strung out with their fear, Gary smiling, um, we were lucky, I have known some directors of health who were in California and got woken up in the middle of the night by their mayors calling to see if they should uh, restrict the football game. Uh, luckily, you didn't get that. But um, because that, that happened this year, please do not be surprised if there is greater surveillance that is undertaken. And what that means is primarily mosquito surveillance. You're already knowledgeable about the fact that we've got these places all around the state where we trap them. We may move them further in this direction and they may put more in our area. Um, again, we're looking to see if the mosquito has penetrated this area. Um, it's not necessarily saying there's increased risk for the whole world. There are also things that are your job and not mine at the town level, and those include things like consideration of larviciding for mosquito control. Um, and I'm sure most of you know what that means. Uh, a larvicide is a product that you put down your, um, what do we call it? Catch basins. Start, yeah, those kind of things, and uh, water, water drains. Uh, and what they will do is kill the larva. Remember where they like to live. They like to live in wet things, like your swimming pool, if you don't take good care of it. Uh, and so when the larva is forming, put the larvicides are, are put in and uh, it kills them off before they become adults. We all know that we want to avoid as much as possible even having the discussion around spraying. Um, again, some of us are old enough to remember when they sprayed. I don't, I don't know, maybe a few people in this room besides me. Um, but there, there are just so many controversies and risks associated, and all you're doing is knocking out the adults. Uh, so we just want to remind you that the towns may have some responsibility when you're thinking of budget time. <laughs> And, uh, and now to talk about climate change and, and why I wanted to bring this up this year. Uh, with the advent of climate change, particularly with increased warming, we will begin to see the immersion of new types of mosquitoes that haven't been here in a very long time or not here at all. And, um, and new diseases that they bring with them. Most people do not know that the Centers for Disease Control was built in the 50s, 1956, because we still had malaria in this country. Um, some of you who, who are history buffs uh, may have read about <laughs> yellow fever uh, and other 
uh, mosquito-borne diseases in Philadelphia and New Jersey where they just wiped out tons of people in the 1800s and 1700s. So there is a great risk that both the types of mosquitoes uh, and ticks and the organisms that they can bring along with them will increase. Um, this is not the time to talk about climate change. I think we should have a forum sometime and talk about all the public health ramifications that go all the way from fighting over water to uh, whether or not we'll be able to feed people. So and I Charlie. <laughs> so I get to jump back in here. Talk a little bit about the services, uh, other services that we provide. As Pat had mentioned, we have, have been responding to the opioid crisis here over the past few years, uh, and CCHD has really been the convener of, of all the local agencies uh, in response uh, to the opioid crisis. And response really goes beyond uh, the emergency medical services that you may think of when somebody has an over, overdose. It includes um, fire, police, uh, EMS, uh, social services, and we work with all of our towns um, to really try to bring a response together for this. Uh, we're very proud we actually did get a, a two-year grant from the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services uh, to help fund these services. Uh, so we actually have a recovery coach now that's actually working uh, in targeted areas uh, according some, to some tools, surveillance tools that we have access to. Uh, so we can actually see uh, on the map where people, where overdoses have happened and we can target our services accordingly to that. Um, we are also reaching out to friends and family uh, we have a recovery group uh, that meets in uh, the town of Berlin uh, where we're actually quarterly do Narcan training now. So we're actually providing uh, Narcan, doing the training for that, and people go home with this very important uh, resource to help counteract an overdose. Um, Man on the street. <laughs> what's that? Yeah. Man on the street. Oh, you're going to the next one. Yep. Wait so. <coughs> you left it for, you were going to do the screenshot. Yeah, well, that the, you can see the map there. Um, that's the map of, of what we call the OD map. Um, this actually shows where the overdoses actually occur uh, within our district. So we have a lot of information that we're able to draw down so that we can assure targeting within the services. And I mentioned that. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted, right. we have a recovery coach. Guys. Yeah, we do. I actually have two recovery coaches because we actually trained our health educator as a recovery coach. Uh, so we actually have two of them, and they've been um, starting to get busy now. Um, environmental health services, this is the foundation of a lot of the work that we do. Uh, the inspection services that, as you see, we did over 1,100 food inspections last year. Uh, about 245 of those uh, occurred here in Wethersfield, and over 400 inspections totaled occurred here in Wethersfield out of all the inspections that we've done. We do inspections on septics, pools, motels, salons, um, and then complaints we follow up on as well. So I mentioned complaints. Uh, last year we had 197 complaints. Uh, 42 of those uh, were housing and environmentally related here in Wethersfield itself. Um, so our inspectors follow up on a majority of housing and property maintenance, about 39% of that are those. Uh, food related complaints, about 23%. Rodents, insects, garbage, air, water, pollution, you name it. Our folks get called and we go out to, to investigate what the public health implications are. Um, protecting other against environmental health services, uh, we have a program called Putting on Airs. Uh, this is our asthma program where we actually use a team of folks, an environmental health professional, an asthma health educator, to go into the town, uh, into the home where primarily children who are affected with asthma get referred to, uh, referred to us. We go do a home inspection, try to identify triggers, and really go through the medications that the doctors may not have time to go through with the individual so that they can assure that they're following their uh, medications appropriately and really managing their disease very well. Uh, January is actually Radon Awareness Month. Everybody knew that, right? <laughs> okay, I knew you guys were, were an educated hip crowd. Uh, so Radon Awareness Month is January. Uh, we actually have free radon kits, a very limited supply of free radon kits in our district. So if you're interested in testing your home for radon, uh, you can always come down to the health district um, down to Celestine uh, and can pick up a free radon kit while our supplies last. After we get rid of our limited supply, we do have some for sale, but we do have some free ones now that we can actually hand out during January. Um, 
Other things within that, as Pat mentioned, lead poisoning prevention is something that we spend a lot of time on education on because there is a variety of ways that people can get lead poisoned. It's not just lead paint anymore. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to promote and encourage healthy behaviors. Uh, many of you, how many people were part of our walking competition in the last several years? I like to see people raise their hands on this <laughs> one. So walking competition is something we're gonna be doing again this year, coming up here in April. Uh, but, you know, to get you guys warmed up, we're actually gonna be doing a February fitness challenge. So if you're interested, please, uh, over the next couple of weeks, check on our Facebook page, check web, our website, uh, because we're gonna be doing a challenge kind of inside to get you up and moving and ready for April, okay? <laughs> Last year, and for every year that we've had this, uh, Berlin has won the overall competition. But now, <laughs> I'm hearing rigged, I'm hearing rigged. But what we want to see, and you guys did a great job, the year before last, y'all had the Impact Award because you had the most people signed up, and that's a great award. Last year, Newington actually took that Impact Award from you guys. We want to see people out there walking in April. Uh, so I encourage all of you, especially on the town council and town leadership, get your folks up and moving. I want to see somebody else's name on the, on the trophy other than Berlin. And I have to say that with my Berlin town chair here. <laughs> Uh, other things that we do, we do respond uh, to disasters and assist our communities in recovery. We do a lot of preparing uh, for emergencies, a lot of planning. Uh, the flu clinics that we talked about, they're actually utilized as drills. So if we had to do medical countermeasure dispensing, uh, we have volunteers that are trained to do that. As Pat said, we have three minutes between door to door. Uh, that doesn't come without a lot of practice and a lot of planning. Uh, in addition to that, we plan for other things like flooding and natural disasters. Uh, one of the last things that I'll talk about today is assuring quality and accessible health services. So we do actually have a grant from the North Central Area Agency on Aging. I got it right this time. Uh, for senior dental screenings. So we do senior screenings free of charge um, within all four of our towns. You know, they do the cleanings. Last year we saw 107 clients all told. And it's so important as we get older, take care of your health, your oral health, because it does affect your overall health. Okay? All right, Pat, hit them, hit them hard. Okay, quick. now now we're going to get to the maybe more controversial discussion. Um, what you have in front of you is a slide of some older uh, data from the United States. Uh, measles is so highly contagious that it is essentially a universal disease in absence of immunization. Uh, and I, I just want to make a comment about something that's going on in the world right now. Um, where they are in the Congo, they are experiencing a dual outbreak of measles and Ebola. And they have had over 1,500 measles deaths in a six-month period. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't want to underplay the fact that these diseases are not only still with us, uh, but that they are dangerous. Uh, in the vaccine you will notice from this picture was licensed in 1963. But prior to that time, all children invariably got measles by the time they were 15 and it was estimated that there were three to four million people infected each year uh, and approximately four to 500 died, 48,000 were hospitalized and about 1,000 suffered from brain encephalitis. Um, if you look at this very quickly, you will notice that as it went out, it, this happens to stop at 2000, but in the year 2000, the United States declared measles eliminated in the United States. Hard to believe. Think about it, we've only eliminated two ever, the other one being smallpox. Um, that, that obviously did not last long. Um, a number of reasons uh, for that happening, but just to give you a little lead up, in 2016, we had 86 cases in the whole country Still not too awful. 
120 in 2017, 375 in 2018, and this year at the close of year we had 1,282 cases of a disease that's not supposed to um, be out there. So what I want to share with you now is um, your town's results from the most recent immunization survey of kindergartners entering school. Uh, I cannot speak to the circumstances in these schools. I don't know your population and your schools, and you will probably be able to interpret this even better than I. Um, the state, when they do this, looks at all kindergartners, in, all kindergartens in the state um, with 30 or more children in it, in a class. Uh, and for some reason, uh, in this last year, we don't seem to have any data from the parochial schools, and I'm, I'm not quite sure why. The overall, as you know, the secret with immunizations is trying to create herd immunity so that if you have a high enough percentage of people who are immunized, uh, the people for whom it didn't take, and these things have takes <coughs> of 95% roughly, and the increasing number of children in our schools who were affected with things like cancer and um, uh, things that affect their immunity that do not allow them to be able to be vaccinated even if we, their parents would want them to, uh, it puts them at greater risk. So you have the two years that we have available to us and you can uh, see here by school um, what it was last year and what it is this year. You're very lucky in one sense, you have zero medical exemptions. You do not have a cohort of really frail kids in school, thank God. But you will notice that um, there are a number of people who are looking at uh, religious exemptions. And I'm particularly, and again, I don't know anything about Hammer, um, but that kind of struck me when I took a look at it. Um, one of your schools has done better. We know these are small numbers, uh, but I, I think it is very interesting. And when we look at coverage, of course, uh, we try, we will add the exemptions together. So if you are, um, if you end up having two or three kids in school in your, that class who are religious exemptions, I'm sorry, medical exemptions, uh, then that percentage could go up to 11 or 12 or 15 percent. And of course, it puts those folks at risk. Again, I do not know all of the uh, ramifications uh, around this for your school systems, but we also don't have the picture of the total schools. Uh, we're not looking at the kids in the cohort from first grade through high school. So we don't know what the problem is there. Uh, I just wanted to bring this to your attention because clearly we need to do better. Uh, this is something that the legislature will be taking up very early in the session and they will be talking about whether or not uh, to get rid of the religious exemption. And I just think it behooves all of us to be interested and involved. Thanks. No, this is this year. Oh, 1819. Yeah. Yep. So, as Pat mentioned, how do we prepare for our future? Um, by looking at a lot of the things that we've done in the past. Um, but one of the main things that we're going to be doing here in this coming year uh, is really looking at the revision, and I've said this the past couple of years, and thanks to the state, they kept putting this off, um, of actually revising our code. Um, all can, our yeah, all of our codes, uh, our code of ordinances. Uh, so we're going to be looking at all of our codes, how they affect um, the individual agencies that we regulate, and we're going to be adopting the FDA food code, which is a major win. 
Uh, one other thing that we need your help with as a town, uh, we're, we actually go through and do a process of community health assessment. Um, and we take a look at our communities, where our health status is, where our challenges and gaps are, and really try to dig in deep to the data to try to figure out where we need to focus our efforts. Um, so we need your help uh, to be involved in that process here in the coming year. Uh, we're starting to already dig into, into the data, uh, but we're gonna start to have conversations, uh, maybe forums, focus groups, uh, to be able to talk about how we want to prioritize uh, for the health within our community. So you guys need to be involved in that, in that um, process. Last word, as always, is thanks. Um, thank you to our member towns. Thank you to our, to our public for continued support. Uh, and we stand ready to answer any of your questions. Great. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Pat. Really do appreciate it. Um, I'll open it up for questions right now from any of the other councilmen. Hi, Bella. thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had two quick questions. On one of the slides on page, well, it's page four in my handout, 2018-19 expenditures, mm -hmm. you have program operating 184-854. How does that number compare to when you were in town halls? I know this is, uh, th is this the first year that you've moved to your new facility? So yeah. how, how do the budget, what's the difference, I guess, between it's, the two? It's, it's a little bit different because the main difference is just in rental expense as far as that was concerned. So we did incur rental expense stepping out, even though we did pay rent in three out of the four towns that we had. Um, so, you know, we did, ex we did get a little bit more operating expenses for rent, um, but, you know, we are trying to counter that with being efficient in how we actually staff up. As we're looking at the FDA code especially, um, what we had planned for if we had to do that in the current configuration that we were in, separated in all th four town halls, we would have had to hire staff in order to meet that particular demand. So by consolidating and being able to use our resources, we look to balance that, that, that actually out. Okay, thank okay. you. Um, Last year. <laughs> Your other question, Amy? My other question was um, on page six where you discussed the tick-borne diseases. How do you come up with those numbers? For instance, Weathersfield had seven cases. Do doctor's offices report it? Are they the bugs being tested? I mean, my daughter's had it twice. I never yeah. called you and told you, hey, my daughter's had Lyme well, disease twice. We have powers as the public health folks, uh, and they include, Not superpowers, but <laughs> they include uh, the fact that all laboratories must report to the state and the town in which the individual lives uh, any of, remember I made reference to these <coughs> reportable diseases and laboratory findings. So that is a reportable disease. If you had a test done in the laboratory, uh, the state would have heard about it and we would have heard about it. And if um, the doctor reported it, I don't know if your daughter had the rash, but that's also reportable by the physician. And so, um, yeah. We don't always follow up individually on every case because that's an endemic disease, but that's how we know about it. So the doctor's offices report as well as, the, um, as tested. The laboratories, yes. Yeah, yes. because and not a, not everybody's tested when you have a, you know, a bullseye this big on your back. The pediatrician doesn't. But the laboratories test. also are required. It goes okay. both ways. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just yeah. wondered how you got that information, how accurate those numbers were. Yeah, and and you know as. As far as accuracy is concerned, I mean, it is, um, you know, it depends upon, as you said, if people are actually going to be tested. So we get confirmed cases, and those are how we basically base our numbers. May we miss some? Absolutely. So we take those numbers always with a grain of salt. Um, yeah, it seemed like it, I was actually, I thought they were low. I mm -hmm. thought you would have seen more um, right. and, and, cases. And, and we do take that into account mm -hmm. as far as that's concerned when we start to look at what programs and services that we need to actually go. Looking at the number that we have of a reported and confirmed cases and really taking a reality check and saying, you know, really what do we have within the community based upon that number? To answer your first question, um, in 17-18, uh, our operating expenditures were 127,000, just a little bit over 127,000. I didn't have 17-18. Okay. <laughs> 
Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. Any other questions? Oh, I'll go on this side. Tom. Uh, <coughs> a couple questions on uh, the increase per capita for your new facility that sounds like it's working out good. Mm -hmm. Did all that extra cost go to the per capita charge or did you look at raising some of the program revenue fees that you we, we, we do a combination and what we try to do is to be able to support the services that we have uh, with the fees associated with those. Um, so we do charge fees for restaurant inspections and things of that nature. Uh, we use a majority of those fee revenues to help support our sanitarians, but it doesn't cover everything that they do. So part of the per capita charge in addition to covering our operating expenses, it does cover our professional staff as well. The second question I had, um, I'm not sure if you would have the answer, but we as a town, what can we do on the uh, uh, exemptions for the vaccine uh, legally? Is that a state law or? It's, it's a state it's law. A state law. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what you can do as a town is to advocate with your state reps um, to be able to really, I mean, from a public health perspective, to, to the religious exemption really doesn't make any sense for us. Um, you know, when we had smallpox, it's, personal. it's a personal choice. So, you know, from a public health perspective, it really is not something that we would really need to see. But we're uh, not allowed to. Yeah, but I mean, talk to your. Yeah, but t yeah, talk to talk to your state representatives because that's where most of the action is going to really happen this year. Uh, they brought it up last year. Uh, they're going to be bringing it up again, uh, and we know that there's other states that have already gone through this process and eliminated the religious exemption. And Seattle, Seattle um, <coughs> has recently was it Seattle? Seattle. Seattle has recently taken uh, the step of uh, not only getting rid of the exemption, but telling folks you will all get vaccinated this year. Yeah, so thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Councilor Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, follow up question from a year ago. Okay. Cromwell is the odd one out here. Mm -hmm. Have we reached out to them to perhaps join and yes, smoo <laughs> smoo smooth it out? And I've asked you this last like four years or so, but you never know. Yeah. You get, how are no, we doing with Cromwell? <laughs> we, we have reached out to Cromwell, and at Cromwell actually um, took a step backwards. Um, they were a full-time health, health department, and um, a there's a loophole in the state statute that allowed them to go back to being a part-time health department, which is extremely or unfortunate for the residents of Cromwell. We continue to reach out there and to be available um, and to look at the the possibility of adding Cromwell as a town to the district if it makes sense on both sides of the equation. Uh, so we've actually costed out what that would be, provided that information to them, and right now the ball's in their court. Could you provide that information to us as well? And it may be something, Mayor, that you would like to talk to the Mayor of Cromwell about. It seems like it makes sense from a, maybe they have their reasons, but for at least from an economic reason to spread out the, uh, the amount that each town pays and, Still provide. Yeah, we can. We benefit. I can definitely do provide that information. Okay. Uh, second question is, what is our process that we have? The the triple E virus over the summer seemed to I don't know catch us by maybe not you by surprise, but mm -hmm. I think that the sport the sports out. leagues was a little bit of a freak out, and I'm oh, yeah. and I'm wondering how we can do a great job responding like ahead of time so that the citizenry knows when there's a da danger level, how to what precautions, what are best practices? Are we cancel actually canceling the football games and the soccer games? Yeah. And, and we didn't see that maybe in Weathersfield, but yeah. I think the citizenry should probably be informed about how, to, how do we handle this as it goes forward? Because I'm I, kind I of expecting I think we agree it. with you, there needs to be an education campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, that one caught us by surprise. As I said, we have been monitoring EEE in the state of Connecticut for as long as I can remember. We even had sentinel pheasants and such, yeah. if you remember. Um, but having a real case, uh, I think, threw everybody. And then to have three and a death um, just panicked everybody. It, it, and I, you may not um, make the same uh, 
analogy I will, but Ebola. I mean, Ebola was nowhere near us, and everybody in the United States was freaked out. So I think uh, the words new and debt really scare people, plus the fact that it's a mosquito, mm -hmm. and I'm outside, and I'm at risk. But let, let me balance this a little bit for folks. Um, think about Florida. So Florida has triple E year round. And how many people have traveled to Florida or had family travel to Florida here in the last year, two years? Yeah. Lots of people. Yeah. Lots not people. a lot of the factor is have you changed your habits, not gone outside, not played soccer, not gone to the beach, not walked around their wonderful swamps. And I'm from Florida, I know exactly what it's all about. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> so um, a lot of it's about risk and about putting and around putting it in perspective. So so while we had um, some cases last year, uh, we really don't see a lot of cases, human cases of triple E. Well, we could see more yeah, because now, of the warning. Now next year, um, as Pat mentioned, uh, we do expect for them to expand surveillance because we have had some, some additional um, human cases. So with that expansion of traps, you're going to hear more about Triple E next year. So we as a district, you know, we'll do our, our job uh, by trying to educate, uh, providing information out there for folks to be able to take into account and being available to you as a town. Uh, we have gotten calls from towns, uh, especially in the heat of this as, as it got closer, saying, you know, what should we do? What do you recommend that we do? And at the recommendation levels that we had, um, it was really, we didn't have to do anything, but really stress the individual protections that people could take. And those protections are really what we want to see with any mosquito-borne disease. Uh, trying to limit the breeding places, trying to make sure that people are um, going out there in proper repellent, and really just taking those personal precautions. I guess what I'm asking or recommending would be to talk to the mayor and talk to the town manager, and this is probably for all the towns, mm -hmm. and to disseminate that information now. So that um, when it comes okay. and, and to I'm the sports leagues you, and all of the rest of them. We will write some things for our four towns, yeah. but the other thing we will do is work with the uh, Connecticut Association of Directors of Health to press the Department of Public Health to also come out with information guidelines. But yeah. you have my promise, and you can <laughs> kick us out if it doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll take Cromwell. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I put a walk-in competition. <laughs> 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 well, once again, we really thank you for the opportunity to come talk to you guys tonight, uh, and we hope that um, you got as much about, out of this presentation as, as we did. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. As that is wrapping up, um, I would like to uh, just at my uh, at my pleasure open the agenda for um, just moving a couple uh, items uh, to before the uh, public comment. Um, if uh, if you so indulge, I would like to open the agenda to move uh, council actions two uh, A and two B to uh, the beginning of the uh, agenda. Second. Thank you. Um, I'll take a vote on that. Motion to uh, open the agenda to move those council items. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Thank you. Um, first, uh, we do have uh, one resignation. I believe it's up here. Um, I can read the letter first or after? Sure. Yeah. Dolores, do you have the letter? Yes, I do. I received a visit by, uh, to my 
from Mike Hurley on the day after Christmas, and he resigned from being on the town council. He wrote a very nice letter to Mayor Rell, the fellow council members, and Jerry and myself. It has been my honor and privilege to serve as a member of the town council in Bettersfield for the past 10 years. Together, along with many former council members and town staff, we have been able to make many significant improvements to the town and to continue to move it forward to difficult financial and social circumstances. Difficult decisions were made and many more difficult decisions remain ahead. During my last fall, um, during last fall's campaign, I was confronted with some significant health issues. Although I am making good progress, my treatment and recovery are requiring more of my time and focus than I had originally anticipated. And I have reached the conclusion that I cannot do justice to my obligations as deputy mayor and a member of the town council. I am humbled by the support and encouragement by my friends and the residents of Wethersfield and will continue to be involved in some communi community uh, activities on a limited basis for the time being. However, it is with regret that I submit my resignation as a member of the town council, effective January 1st, 2020. I thank you for your friendship and wish you all the best for the holidays and a happy new year. From Mike Hurley, Deputy Mayor of Wethersfield. I would make a motion to accept the resignation of Mike Hurley, Deputy Mayor, 76 Birch, uh, for the term of 2019-2021. Second. Motion and seconded. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Thank you, Dolores. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom. Uh, now for appointments. I make a motion to appoint Mary Pelletier, 61 State Street, to the Town Council, effective 1620, for the remainder of the term, two year term. Thank you. Second. second. Motion's made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor <coughs> signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes have it. Thank you. And yeah, actually, yeah, we'll do. We'll Dolores, would you do the honor to swear Mary in? Why don't you please sit this side so you can, they can see you. Okay. <laughs> Better raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Mary Pelletier, swear that I will faithfully discharge my duties. I, Mary Pelletier, swear that I will faithfully discharge my duties. As a member of the Town Council of the Town of Wethersfield. As a member of the Town Council of the Town of Wethersfield. According to the laws of the United, the Constitution of the United States. According to the laws of the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Connecticut. The, cons the Constitution of the State of Connecticut. And the Wethersfield Town Charter. And the Wethersfield Town Charter. To the best of my ability, so help me God. To the best of my ability, so help me God. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. While, while you're up there, did you want to say anything or do you want to have a seat? Uh, oh, yeah, I could say. You're, you're on now, Mary. <laughs> okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Set the timer. No, I'll be very brief. I, I'll be very brief. I just, I just wanted to really thank Mike Hurley for his many years of um, public service to the town of Wethersfield. And I know that his presence on the council will be uh, greatly missed. I'm very honored to be appointed to, um, to serve out his term, and I hope to continue his uh, legacy of public service. I'm looking forward to working with all of you guys um, on both sides, and um, and I'm looking forward to listening to the citizens of Wethersfield, hearing everyone's concerns, um, and working hard to to move the town forward and confront the challenges that we face. And um, and I and I and I just uh, look forward to. I, I hope to make Wethersfield maybe an even better place to live. And thank you for putting your trust in me. 
all you guys and Rich also. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we have just one more um, because Mike was deputy mayor. We have a uh, open appointment for uh, deputy mayor. Uh, I'll take the liberty and I'll nominate Tom Mazzarella for deputy mayor. Can I get a second? Second. I, mean, I, I was waiting for you. No, it's a, I didn't want to, to hold you hanging there too long. Tom. <laughs> um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Congratulations, Tom. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, it's kind of bittersweet uh, with Mike leaving. Uh, us, but I'll try to uh, carry on with uh, how he presented himself and the good things he did for Weathersfield. So, thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll just go back to the agenda. Uh, public comments. Uh, Ms. Cohen, how are you? Hi everyone, my name is Deborah Cohen and I live at 73 Church Street here in town. Um, I really do appreciate the, the chance to make the following comments and hope that there will be continued conversation about this going forward. Following the shooting and death of Anthony Jose Vega Cruz last summer, our then serving town council chose to make no comment regarding police accountability until a full report was made available by the office of state's attorney, Gail Hardy. The same council also chose not to call for an investigation into the hiring of the police officer who shot Anthony. What the council did do was to promise a series of community conversations, the purpose of which remains unclear since only one ever took place. I believe a second was planned for pa this past September, but no such meeting was held to my knowledge. While I was not in attendance at the first meeting, it is my understanding that no mention of Anthony's death was made by the event organizers. Recent reports have alerted us to the backlog of reports in Gail Hardy's office. Conclusions from that office regarding Anthony's case are still incomplete. While I do not advocate the speeding up of such an important investigation for the sheer goal of having closure, if that's even possible, <clears throat> I strongly urge this council to maintain regular and interactive contact with Ms. Hardy's office to determine what progress has been made what that progress entails, and when Weathersfield can expect a report. Results of such contact should be shared with Weather, excuse me, Weathersfield residents on a regular basis. The absence of such communication leaves the impression that Weathersfield is content with waiting indefinitely for the report and ignoring the death of a teenager in the process. I have no reason to believe that everyone will be satisfied with the report results. Many of those who believe that no wrong was done and that Anthony got what he deserved will continue to believe so, as will many who believe that his shooting was an egregious overstepping of police power and that the officer who killed him should be held accountable. However, in the absence of a police commission, it is the town council's responsibility to be visible and vocal in demanding accountability from the state attorney's office. The silence on the part of Weathersfield leadership to date has been deafening. I know that I know from past experience that um, it's not the habit of town council to have go, um, conversation going back and forth between those of us who come and share comments. But I would just like to say that at some point in the near future, I would really like to hear from some of you. I'd really like feedback on what I've just shared with you because I think this is one of the most important things that are facing that are facing our town, and um, it seems to have disappeared in the wind. So. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. Just for the record, just for the record, Carolyn Ikari, McCarthy, 123 Stillwold, um, and I join in Ms. Cohen's remarks. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Megan Hartline, 19 Rosedale Street. Um, I also just wanted to come and second Ms. Cohen's remarks. Um, 
as I wrote in the Hartford Current a couple of weeks ago, um, I strongly believe that municipalities need to be doing more um, when it comes to issues related to our police. Um, and in our case specifically, Weathersfield should be publicly addressing Anthony's death and taking major steps and sharing them about how our town is working to prevent further instances of police violence. Um, and so I just wanna ask that um, our town leadership commit to publicly taking steps, not just doing things behind closed doors, which I very much hope are happening, but um, actually telling uh, your constituents and the town members what y'all are doing to um, make sure that we find out um, the results of this investigation and how we can continue moving forward to both prevent things and to address um, how and why this happened so that we can ensure that Weathersfield has, is a safe community for everyone who lives here, who works here and who visits here. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak? Mr. Young. And I forgot and neglected to say, we do try to keep it at five minutes in the beginning and five minutes at the end. So if you could keep it in. <coughs> You've been here before, you know the practice. I know, I know. Thank I know. you. Uh, good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, <clears throat> I was surprised to hear that Mr. Hurley wasn't coming back uh, I read it in the, min the agenda that he wasn't going to be coming back to the town council, which, uh, you know, it's, it's too bad. Uh, Mr. Hurley and I didn't agree on many things, but we did agree on a number of, number of things as well. And uh, one of the things that uh, we did agree on was he did stand up for the citizens of this town to come to this podium and talk talk in the way that we talk today. Under the, the situation that occurred was under the Forest Commission, headed up by Mr. Matthew Forrest. He had some new ideas of how we were able to talk, which limited us considerably. So I think Mr. Hurley has a lot, lot going for him uh, as, as, a, as a former town council member for standing up for the citizens' rights to talk. I hope Mr. Mazzarella, who's now the new deputy mayor, uh, can continue with at least that portion to stand up for the citizens' rights to talk. Um, I guess we'll, we will really miss Mr. Hurley, even though uh, you know he, he and I didn't agree on a great deal of things, but we'll miss him. Um, tonight you had the discussion regarding the health district and I had made some comments last year after the health district left or after their presentation about several items. But one of the items that, that really comes to light is, and, and I know last year they were in the mode of moving, moving from what I understand the town of Weathersfield basement or somewhere, and they were moving to a private, a private rental space. And as we can see, they, they had operating expense up on the board tonight of around $180,000, $185,000, which would include some of that rental space cost. And uh, granted, they might be across uh, the other three districts, um, Rocky Hill, Berlin, and Newington. I don't know what their, I don't recall what they said, their uh, rentals or their, where their, where their offices were, whether they were in town-owned property or private rentals. But I really think we should consider the fact of putting them into town-owned property. And I've complained more than once from this podium how we had the Standish House down in Old Weathersfield that is currently being rented for $100 a year. That would have been an adequate place to put the health district instead of them paying forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year to some private 
We could have also used the Kinney Center for the health district, which again, we collect $100 a year for rental, to rent that entire building. And we also incur on the, both of those buildings additional costs. We just had the Standish House painted and it was in the six figure numbers. We paid for it, but we only collect $100 a year, which is pathetic. And I think I sent all of you folks, you finally sent all of you folks, a copy of the lease for both of those properties, which really came from the town of Wethersfield originally. So I hope you all read those leases. We need to find a way to utilize more of our own space than to go out on the street and rent property. Another one is the transitional academy that we have here in Wethersfield. I had suggested some other uh, ways of putting, uh, other places to put it, but we ended up going out to the private and renting space up the street on the Silas Dean Highway because it's on a bus line. And we're paying somewhere around $60,000, $50,000, $60,000 a year for that. Plus we're paying insurances, we're paying all the, the goodies that go with it to, to rent a piece of property when we could have used our own properties, and we didn't. That's the great wisdom that we have in this town. It's almost zero. But I hope we have a new team here, and I hope this new team will do something about that. Look at that lease. Get rid of that lease. Take the property back. Bring the health district into the Kinney Center. Bring the, the transitional academy into the Kinney Center. They're on bus lines. If we recall correctly, the superintendent made a big deal out of how he had to have a transitional academy on the bus line, but he totally disregarded the Kinney Place. Of course, he had to because it was already under rent, but we just went through a period of time where we could have gone and renegotiated that rent, and our former town council majority didn't do a thing okay. about it. Thank you, Mr. So anyway, I, I, you know, I keep talking about we got to find ways of reducing our costs somewhere. We are looking. Thank you. Suge it's a suggestion. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Rita Ann Owen, um, 42 Wells Farm Drive. Um, I came tonight uh, simply to say I support the um, new property maintenance code um, that you're going through. Can you just bring the sure. microphone? Just, yep, thank you. Better? Yes, much better. Okay. I just wanted to support the uh, property maintenance code um, that you're going to be discussing. Um, I think it is so important for our town to have a, a reasonable and enforceable code, so I like some of the new language that was put in there, so I just wanted to thank those that wor worked on that because I think that um, <coughs> it's nice to know that it's going to be able to be enforced uh, once things are come to your attention. Um, also, it used to be that there was a um, maintenance code report, I think it was quarterly, and that used to be attached to the manager's weekly report when it came out. I haven't seen that in a while, so I would just like to suggest that I think that would be a good thing to, to reinstate. Um, and also, when you go to the home page, it would be nice to have that maintenance code as one of the tabs on the right-hand side so that people can access it easily. So thank you very much. Thank you. Could I just get your uh, full name again? I'm sorry. Uh, Rita Ann Owen, 42 Owen. Wells Farm Drive. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Colantonio? Good evening, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Uh, Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, you know, every, the beginning of every meeting, we do say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And at the very end, says with uh, liberty and justice for all. 
<coughs> except for some people on Morrison Avenue, I guess. But anyway, I started a long time ago. <laughs> it's been over 10 years. And uh, since we have six out of nine new <coughs> town council, I, I feel like, you know, I have to repeat myself. But and uh, I would like to request that basically or probably to the town manager that somebody else, some kind of engineer, look at my situation and see if they agree with the previous uh, town engineer or town manager or even like, you know, the existing uh, town engineer right now. So, but I'm going to repeat myself again and uh, I have to excuse for the people that have heard them before, but that's the way it's going to be. <coughs> I'm going to quote the police report in 2009. Quote, stop signs should not be used for speed control. That's correct. Stop signs should be installed in a manner that minimize the number of vehicles having to stop. Once the decision has been made to install two-way stop control, the decision regarding the appropriate street to stop should be based on engineering judgment. In most cases, the street carrying the lowest volume of traffic should be stopped. A stop sign should not be installed on the major street, on the major street, unless justified by traffic engineering study. The very reason that the citizen states we, <coughs> we need a stop sign there is the very reason a stop sign should not be added there, end of quote. And the report is talking about me because I requested a stop sign and he's telling me that because of this, fine. Now, let me say that I agree with all the points and I believe that the stop sign at Hillcrest Avenue are not needed nor required, but the stop sign is needed on Morrison Avenue because Tifton Road, intersectional side distance, does not meet the code. Uh, now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna compare Hillcrest Avenue and Morrison Avenue, but in no way I mean to remove any stop sign on Hillcrest Avenue at all. Whatever it is there, it's fine. I'm comparing the two so you can see the difference and you hopefully see why we need the stop sign on Morrison Avenue. Morrison Avenue is 24 feet wide. Hillcrest Avenue is 30 feet wide. That makes it a little bit safer. Morrison Avenue is a three foot grass strip on both sides, except for where there is no strip at all. Hillcrest Avenue is a 15 foot grass strip. Morrison Avenue has an average daily traffic of 730 cars. Hillcrest Avenue has an average daily traffic of 365. You wonder why? It's because of the stop signs. The distance between the front of the houses is less than 100 feet on Morrison Avenue. It's 150 feet on Hillcrest. The town has taken measurements for the intersection side distance for Orchard at Hillcrest and found to be 344 feet. To the east is 970 feet to the west. You don't need the stop signs there, but you have two of them. Uh, the town has also taken uh, you know, some measurements from uh, Tifton Road uh, on Morrison Avenue for 232 feet. Based on that, that distance is good only for about 24 miles per hour. The posted speed is 25 and the average 85th percentile, it's about 31 miles per hour. So most of the people are breaking the law and yet over 10 years, you have guys have not done anything at all. I don't know where else to go, but I will not go away. Now, for some of the new people, okay, when you look at Hillcrest Avenue versus Morrison Avenue, Morrison Avenue never connected to Silas Dean until 1955. Morrison Avenue from the beginning was meant to be a dead end street. Now, after so many years, Morrison Avenue has twice as many cars on Hillcrest Avenue, and yet nobody wants to do anything. Can somebody else look at this? I've been an engineer for 37 years. I've been giving good advice for a good money, and yet when I talk to the town for free advice, they walk away from me, and I have to ask, What's wrong with them? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. Anybody else want to speak? Mr. Rue.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. George A. Rue, 956 Cloverdale Circle. I'd like to welcome those people that I don't know, and although I know six out of the nine that are on the council, I hope the rest of you to get to know you somewhere along the line. So I, I wanted to just wish you well and, and your endeavors and where we agree and where we disagree. Uh, I was not planning to say anything tonight, and the only reason I came is because I had, wanted to get out of the house and I wanted to let people know I'm still alive. <laughs> I walk a lot slower, but I'm still very interested in what's happening in town. A couple of things I just, and, and I had not planned any comments, but I have a few now. Uh, a couple of things from the uh, health district report, a very comprehensive, <laughs> long presentation. <laughs> uh, but there was about one sentence that caught my attention. And it says, uh, how did I, I even wrote it down, because I thought it was kind of interesting. Oh, climate change and warming. It's a real thing. I just thought I'd share that with you for whatever that's worth. Intellectually, you can all digest what I'm telling you, okay? And then they went on again to say, climate change again, they spoke. We'll see new mosquitoes. New ones will be showing up, and it's going to be a problem. And it's a real problem. And I know all of you understand that. Enough said on that subject. The, uh, the other thing I would like to uh, just comment briefly in a positive way to the remarks Mrs. Cohen made. Uh, last September, or uh, shortly after that shooting took place, I made some inquiry as to when the subsequent meeting was going to be held. And, you know, I'm old and I'm slow and sometimes I forget stuff and all that kind of good stuff. But in any of it, nothing ever happened. But I, I, I think there's some valid points that were raised by Mrs. Cohen and her associate Caroline. I guess she left already. Uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, other than, other than that, uh, I just thought I'd let you know I'm alive and wish you well. Welcome, Mary. Thank you. And, and, and it was funny. I commented to you when you came in. Geez, you're all gussied up tonight. I usually, <laughs> see, I usually see you at Corpus Christi School in a very informal attire. And then when they mentioned that, that, that well, Mike was retiring, I looked over and I whispered to the person, to the lady sitting next to me, who I'm, I said, Mary's going to get the job. <laughs> and then I also said, when, when the deputy mayor, I said, Tom's going to be that. And it's good. So congratulations on that. And uh, I'll save, I got a couple other comments, but I'll, that's under the public hearing on the, on the ordinance, right? Great. Thank you. Anybody else for public comment before we go into uh, the hearing for the ordinance? Anybody else? Okay. Um, I will uh, now open it up for a hearing. Oh, no, actually, Dolores, you wanted to have yeah. a comment. I'm sorry. I just wanted to let no people know that party endorsements for... Um, Party people who, if you're already in a party and you want to be in the other party to vote for in the primary, you have until January 28th to change your party. If you don't change your party, you can't vote. You can only vote in your party. And, and unaff unaffiliated voters cannot vote in either party. Is there a deadline for unaffiliated switching to a... Major yes. party status. As long as as long as they have not been in the party, they can go right up until like the day before the okay. primary. And but one new noon. 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 And our primary is on what date? April twenty eighth. April twenty eighth. Okay. Sorry about that. Peace That's out. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'll uh, now open the hearing for the ordinance to amend Chapter one, uh, 122, Blighted Premises. Um, and I believe um, Mrs. Owen had already spoke on that. So no problem. I don't know if you wanted to come back up and continue any anything further. Okay, thank you. Mr. Rue? You're getting your exercise, too. <laughs> You're getting the exercise. Yeah, yeah. Well, the health department sort of conveyed a message to me that exercise is very vital, and you've got to be doing what you're pro <laughs> promising. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, I, I, did, I wasn't even aware of this, but I read it tonight, and there's one section caught my attention. 
and I guess uh, Gary and I, we talked about it, and it's the uh, removal of weeds and similar vegetation. Well, you know, I've been, of late, I've been studying geese. I'm almost getting a degree in gooseology because we've had lots of geese on our, on our pond. And uh, the other day I saw for the first time a, an albino goose. And all the other geese, they sort of, uh, they, they avoided that particular one. And we had about 50 geese there, according to bear's count. But in any event, uh, on a, uh, on the part that caught my attention, the uh, part section B, every owner, occupier of property shall keep the property free from vegetation of any type, which in the opinion of the town manager or his or her designee is injurious, injurious to public health. And uh, if for the people that don't know that, that town, that piece of property I'm speaking to belongs to our friends here on the, you know, in town. And uh, one of the things uh, that, uh, that uh, I, I'm just going to bring it up in a humorous way, Kathy and her crew have been doing a great job on cutting the grass and keeping that neat and orderly. But after having spent nearly a quarter of a million dollars fixing that thing just a couple of years ago, there's a lot of growth growing in that is gradually going to be moving into the pond and I, when I was a kid, I think they used to call them cattails. I don't know what you call them today, but they're, you know, they're these big things. And when I called some time back, or I called it to the attention, they were very diligent, and Kathy and her crew came down, and they cut a lot of the stuff that was on the land part, but they didn't have their boots on that day, so they couldn't go in the water to pull the, pull the cattails out. So, is Kathy still? No. I'm, I'm not Kathy picking on you. Sally. I'm just Sally. 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 Oh, Sally, I'm sorry, Sally, Sally, I, I beg your pardon. It just goes to show you how old I'm getting. Uh, so, uh, you know, she, the, uh, the, the, this has to be done, I think, simple that I am, because if it doesn't happen, the whole thing is going to be just one filled in swamp again. And all these geese that come and keep us company, they wouldn't have any place to land. And they wouldn't have, to, they wouldn't have the space to take off. And when they talk, take off in groups of 40 or 50, <laughs> and we had about 50 of them the other day, and it, you know, that's not being kind to the geese. And it interf interrupts my study of gooses. I mean geeses. No, I mean geese. <laughs> so so it's, it's been a lot of fun. But I would really like to suggest that you get down there and clean that out and do not leave the debris that you cut out where it's, where it's lying. Make it go away. And I thought it kind of, that was about the only thing that I saw in this thing uh, that, I, that caught my attention. Uh, but I have one other quick note. Uh, one thing I've noticed, and I say this in a more serious way, throughout town I see in many pr areas, including my own, where we have commercial vehicles parked with big signs on them. And I believe there's an ordinance that says you can't do that. But I'm not exactly certain about that. So I think if that's the case, I see Cox and I see, these are well-known well -known companies where, they, where the trucks and the vehicles are there almost all of the time. I think that should be addressed because it does have a, del uh, a degrading impact on the neighborhood if you've got commercial trucks parked all over the place. With that, I say thank you. Thank you. I'm going to use five minutes? Almost no. no. Uh, George, and if you want to, George, if you want to uh, either talk to either the town manager or myself about those commercial vehicles, just let us know a little bit more information. I, will, I, will. I wanted to meet with Gary, but he was busy and on budget, and I was not that busy, and it was not a disaster, and I wasn't in the mood for that much fun at, this, at the moment. So I really haven't thought about it. Anyway. Okay. So. Thank you. Anybody else wanted to speak on the uh, ordinance or the public hearing for the ordinance? Okay, thank you. I'll just disperse my agenda. Um, then I will call that uh, hearing closed, and then we'll go to reports from boards and commissions. Anybody have any reports? Councilor Flanagan? I have uh, two reports. Parks and Rec uh, met on December 19th. Uh, Mary Tebow was promoted. She was a recreation supervisor, and now she's assistant director. Uh, Sally Katz graciously uh, addressed the group for quite a while and uh, answered questions from the board members regarding some of the procedures to maintain the athletic fields. Um, 
some things of note is that they are doing work that can be done in the winter. I know it's kind of hard with some of the weather, but uh, they're working on concessions and bathrooms and that sort of thing. Um, they know the growing seasons and they're seeding and aerating the fields at least twice a season. Um, the part of the struggle with maintaining some of the fields is that whereas in the past sports like baseball and soccer have been one season sports, they've now become three season sports with travel ball and practice and that sort of thing. So uh, that's part of the struggle and uh, I got the sense that uh, figuring out a way to rest some of the fields at some point would probably be an ideal way to heal some of the wear patterns on the fields. Um, and lastly, um, it's, a, it's a simple point, but encouraging people to clean up after themselves. A lot of times we have to send town employees to go pick up garbage off the fields, which obviously takes time and town resources when people can just throw out their own stuff after their kids' games. Um, the uh, capital improve, uh, improvement program, there were uh, two things presented to us. The first was a 10-year plan. It was a, a fairly large list with 33 projects. Um, to pursue up until 2030. 32 of them <coughs> were funded with the general fund and one was with a local bond. And then there was a, a prioritized top 10 list of projects. Um, the number one project was uh, the sidewalks and the ramp at the Nature Center. Um, this came up about a month and a half ago, but there are some large cracks and crumbling, um, which is becoming a safety issue. Uh, the second meeting I attended was the Youth Advisory Board on the second. Uh, the toy drive was a huge success. Um, parents and guardians actually had gifts to choose from this year. We had so many, I believe over 200 families uh, got to pick out some gifts this year. So uh, obviously a, a huge thank you to the participants and um, the Youth Services Department for doing that. Uh, they're preparing for a busy spring. Uh, they have a fundraiser in April for their scholarship and recognition event in May. Uh, they give a scholarship to a Wethersfield student who goes above and beyond in the community. Uh, so they're going to start interviewing candidates in March. And um, they're spending a lot of time in, in subcommittees working on a drug-free community grant. Um, it's a 10-year grant. It's $125,000 a year. Um, so that's obviously would, would really build up the town's capacity for uh, different programs and counseling for different families and youth who are in crisis. So they're really getting into gear and getting ready to submit their application for that. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Councilwoman Bella. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I attended the Historical Society board meeting and library board meeting in December. The um, Historical Society had a busy month with holiday events. They um, mentioned that the Francis House is still for sale. There's an offer pending. The Herbert Dunham House is having a first floor restroom renovated and a ramp being installed. Um, they have fundraising ongoing and some upcoming events. The Taste of Wethersfield is scheduled for April 4th and the house tour is scheduled for June 13th. The library, um, the Friends of the Library had a successful book sale in November raising about $7,000. The library hosted several programs throughout the month of December. Uh, the library board's reviewing its insurance policy and reworking its lost damaged materials policy. Um, and the board made a motion to ask the friends of the library for support on both an upcoming children's program, Turn It Up Music and Movement, and for funding for the disposal of materials that were not sold during their book sale. Um, and I'd like to just take a moment of personal privilege to welcome Mary to the town council. It's wonderful to have another woman serving as an elected official, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. And a congratulations to Deputy Mayor Mazzarella as he begins his um, tenure as Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Bellow. Anybody else with reports, boards, and commissions at all? Okay. Thank you. Um, right now, um, I will take the liberty to... Um, you know, establish a, a committee for the um, town attorney. It's an RFP for a town attorney. I think this was mentioned by the town manager at our last meeting. Uh, every two years uh, by town charter, the uh, town attorney position is uh, up for review or for renewal. And uh, we're gonna be doing that this, uh, this time around. Um, 
with that said, I did talk to some of the members up here for the um, establishment of a, um, a committee to review the RFPs that have come in. There are a number of them that came in. I believe the deadline was December 20th, 30th? Okay, so the, the deadline has come and gone and the um, RFPs are in. Um, we're ready to start looking at those. Um, Councilwoman Bello and um, Pelletier, as well as Councilman Pentelo, uh, are the three that will be reviewing the, uh, the RFPs for the uh, town attorney position. Uh, I do appreciate you guys volunteering or accepting the, the request to volunteer for those. Uh, I do appreciate it. It is uh, um, a, a weighty um, concern for, uh, for us right now with uh, this review having to come up for the town attorney. And then, so for um, council action, um, we do not have any um, referrals. We've gone through uh, reg uh, resignations and appointments. And right now, and I see Sally in the audience, uh, we do have a uh, town purchase of gasoline bid uh, before us. And I don't know if Gary, you wanna talk or have Sally come up, but. I'll, I'll happily start the intro and she can take it from there. The, this agenda item involves the purchasing of gasoline for the 2020 calendar year. Uh, the town is piggybacking off of the CROG bid. Uh, and with that, I don't know if you have any questions or if Sally wants to fill in any additional, she can. And for the record, and thank Sally you, Mayor Katz, and Director Council. of Physical Services. Yes. Uh, once a year, CROG, um, which is the Capital Region Council of Governments, goes out to bid. Uh, for the, this is for unleaded gasoline that is used for all of our fleet vehicles. They go out to bid and while we do receive the pricing from Krog, on the day that we are going to lock in on our pricing, um, even the information given to us by Krog says we need to contact um, one or two of the vendors to see what the prices are on that day. On the day that we were looking to lock in on the price, Dime Oil, who is our current vendor, uh, was slightly less expensive than East River, who was also, these were the two top, um, well, in, in that they were the two lowest um, bidders for, uh, for unleaded. And so we are, uh, my division is proposing that we continue to award this for the next year to Dime Oil. Thank you. Is there any questions from council members? Councilor Hill? Um, I just have a quick question regarding the term. Um, wh why is it that this runs on a January to December calendar year as opposed to a, a regular fiscal year? That's how Krog, that Krog does it. That's how Krog does it. And then in July, I'll be coming to you because that's when we do a different um, fuel bid. So yeah, they stagger them for- okay. Understood, thank you. But what we do is we do um, look at the cost differentials um, when we are doing the budgets. Okay, Councilor Mazzarella. Uh, Sally, so the prices change daily, I gather. It's a commodity, yes. So did you, do you go out and call each one of those before you decide what to lock in or? Yes, we call and um, normally, we call the top two because those are the ones that are usually in best competition with each other and that is what we did and on the day that we chose that we decided to lock in we called both received written documentation from both stating what their price was on that day and dime was low thank you anybody else and dime is currently our yes vendor. and we've had a very good record with them with uninterrupted service Okay. Do they, um, and in, for gasoline, is gasoline only for the town or is gasoline for the Board of Ed as well? The Board of Ed has one vehicle now. Um, they have a van that they use and so they do fill up at our filling station. But they have, um, but now that we have, uh, are, have the custodians with us, their vans are <coughs> physical <coughs> services vans, so. Okay. Yeah, it's just one vehicle for the Board of Ed. Okay, and then. Or two, excuse me, the mail person has one. Uh, mail delivery? Yes, mail delivery. Okay. 
do we? The Board of Ed has a small van, which they, and we charge them for the gas. Okay. Um, do we do, okay, that, I'll have to talk to you um, further about that, I think. I would like to ask some questions about that um, relationship between the board and the, uh, the town on that, but uh, mm -hmm. that can be saved for a later date. Just mm -hmm. knowing that the gasoline is paid for by the board suffice for this for right now. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion for uh, the purchase of town gasoline? Motion to oh. approve staff recommendation to um, contract with Dime Oil. Do I have a second? Second. Motion to, yeah, motion was made by Brooks. Okay. Yep, sec. Motion to award. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Motion's adopted. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. No ordinances, resolutions, so we'll go right into minutes. Um, before we uh, approve the minutes, I do have. Mayor, oh. um, are we not accepting the, doing the ordinances this meeting? No. Oh. Yeah, not. Yeah, do you want to answer? Yeah, uh, it'll be because it was a public hearing. Um, it was, it's an opportunity for, in case there were questions or concerns, we wanted to give the council an opportunity to consider any public comments that took place during the hearing so the action would take place at the next meeting okay. since there were no comments or concerns thank you mm -hmm. um, before I make a motion to uh, adopt the minutes I did want to uh, include uh, I don't believe they're in our minutes that we have that uh, we came out of executive session last meeting and we actually took a vote public vote on um, the uh, current lawsuit with uh, is it Arrow Road. 61. 61 Arrow Road. And uh, the motion was adopted uh, six to one, if I believe correctly. Yes. 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 Six so to one with two absent. Uh, six to one with one person being absent and uh, one council member uh, voting nay. Two absent. I Mike believe Curley. Mike and I were both yeah. absent. Oh, and the mayor. Yes, yes. six. Yep. Yes, six, six, to six to one. Six to one. So, um, and with that added, um, if you guys have had a moment to review the the minutes, um, make a motion to approve the minutes now as amended. Second. There's a second. <laughs> um, motion is uh, made and seconded. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. I'll Eyes abstain have. from oh. the, the and I'll vote. abstain as well. <coughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. And we're back to public comments. Mr. Colantonio. Good evening again. Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Uh, you know, I do watch a lot of TV, especially news now. I'm retired. I don't do anything all day long. So, But something that uh, really caught my eye or my thoughts, my desire, is the homelessness in this country, especially when you're talking about New York, talking about California, you know, Oregon, I guess, and in Connecticut. And something came to mind. And I just investigate a little bit. I talk a lot, you know, I don't say much, but I talk a lot. And, uh, and in Wethersfield, it's amazing what happens. I know that uh, the state allows, if you don't pay the taxes, property taxes, after a while, the time has the right to kick you out, sell your property, and do whatever. And that bothers the hell out of me because it seems to me that the town and identity as the town is basically reinforcing the idea of homelessness. Now, the case in point is my, uh, my neighbor in the backyard. When I moved to this town in 1973, in 1973 February, snow and everything else, in the back of my yard was beautiful and uh, there was this elderly couple 
older. I was young, so you know, 60, that was old. Now it's no longer old. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm 70 now, so. <laughs> but, but you know, they, they were a couple that no kids, no nothing, and they weren't paying taxes and whatnot, you know. And they lived there for a few years, and uh, I became friends with them. And then one passed away, the husband, and then the wife eventually passed away. They never had any kids, so they never used any any benefits from the town, I guess, and they gave it to the nephew. The nephew went in the army, you know, he came back, he was a little bit screwed up, and uh, so he had problems. He had problems that he could not pay taxes. A few years ago, he could not pay taxes. You know, I tried to get involved here and there. The father stepped up and he paid the taxes. Well, three years later, the same thing happened. And the town basically kicked him out. Sold that property for seventy-six thousand dollars. They put some money into it, and whatever it is, they flipped it, and they got probably about three hundred thousand dollars. Now, where did the guy go? You know, it is sad that we behave the way we behave. Mm -hmm. That property was used by a family for over fifty, sixty years. They never got anything from the town because they never had any kids. And most of the cost, yeah, you can say that it's the police. You know, I mean, we move in the snow here and there and everywhere. But most of the cost or most of the taxes that we pay, they go to the Board of Education. Mm -hmm. And yet, those people never got a penny back. Now they sold the house. And I don't know where the guy is. Is he homeless? I guess so. They sold for seven. I, I could see it if it's a bag. You give the money something and it says, we got to do something. But the town, what is the compassion? You guys give help to people that cannot afford to, to pay their own rent, and yet you turn around and kick somebody out and put them on the street? Is that fair? I, I don't think so. Is this the, the, the town that I, that I moved in in 1973? Something happens, <coughs> excuse me, something happens to me now. In two or three years, I cannot pay taxes. What's going to happen? You're going to kick me out after I pay taxes since 1973? Is that how you work? Even though the state allows, yeah, you got to go after your money. But it's ridiculous. It's sad. When the own town, when somebody has lived right here for so many years, is willing to kick you out, put you on the street, and then they go on TV and say, we have homeless people. Who created those homeless people? The town alone. The taxes keep on going up. So probably in your discussion sometimes, executive or whatever it is, but I, I, I think something like that, you know, it needs to be looked at. The guy's not going to go any place. Again, like, you know, he lost everything. It's, uh, um, I mean, $76,000, a lot alone, it's 100000 And you give it away. Well, you've got to live with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. Anybody else wanting to speak? Public comment? Mr. Young? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Uh, Mr. Colantonio is so right about the situation where a person is taxed and taxed and taxed to where he can't afford to pay his taxes. And then, of course, the town comes in and after a number of years and fork, what's it called, tax lien, which is very popular here in town. So the town's got to get their money, even though they've jacked everybody's taxes up so high. And then they wonder why. They wonder why we see articles in the newspaper in the Hartford Current, 22,000 left the state in one year period. Why? High wage job erosion continues. Slow recovery from the recession of 2008. And there's more like this. And it's the towns themselves who have caused a great deal of this trouble. I mean, we now, and I've been complaining about this, and I've talked about this. We have people that are leaving, people 
who have money. And then the article mentions we have people, and I've talked about people coming in, but this, the, the articles talk about international immigration. People coming in from who knows where into Connecticut. And they don't have the kind of money that the people had who left or are on their way out. Leaving you with a poorer group of people in your town. And this goes for all the towns. But the state of Connecticut, the town of Wethersfield, and all the other towns haven't considered any of this by raising taxes and squeezing people. I'll leave. You'll be happy when that happens. But I'll take my money and I'm going to leave. And maybe an international immigrant will come in and buy my house or the state will buy my house for that person. I say that. The state might buy it. Because I see some numbers out there in the state of Connecticut's general ledger that are very suspicious to how a lot of this, these people are coming in here with nothing and how they're living. And I believe they're living on the rest of us. Because I've seen in the general ledger of the state of Connecticut some numbers that are called undisclosed. They won't tell you where the money went. But anyway, we have seen good people, retired people, leave who had money, and other people came in with a lot less, leaving us a problem. And the problem starts right here. We've seen year after year our taxes going up. We've seen purchases being made that should not be made. We just saw a piece of property get bought by this town for $2.4 million, and we paid a heck of a lot of money for something that was worth nowhere near $2.4 million. We buy trucks and we buy all kinds of vehicles. I just heard tonight, a few minutes ago, where the Board of Education has two vehicles. I was looking at their student activity fund last year, and they were buying all kinds of parts out of that fund. They were repairing automobiles and vehicles, and I'm going back to look at that. Because if they only have two vehicles, what in the world were these vehicles that they were repairing out of a student activity fund? Well, let's call it an offline ledger fund. I know in there is the student activity fund, and there's a whole, whole bunch of other funds in there. Ski fund, huh? It's funds that don't belong there, that we're paying for. We should really get into the, into the weeds of all of these costs because the prior administration or the prior <coughs> majority refused year after year to do a thing about it. And we're in, this, we're in this bind. We're at the point where we have to throw people out of their house who don't pay their taxes because the town needs the money to pay for a $2.4 million piece of, piece of property that wasn't worth anywhere near that price, nor was the appraisal put out to the public. It was withheld by the majority or by the town council last year. And it was what? When you were negotiating it, when the town manager was negotiating it, it said the value of the appraisal was $1.7 million. No wonder they didn't want to put out the appraisal to the public on a price tag of $2.4 million. We have the most outrageous people that represent us. Thank you, Mr. Young. Been, who have really put the, the kibosh to the entire town. And everybody should know about that. Yes, sir, I know my time is up and I have a lot Appreciate more to talk it. about. I'll be back. Tune in next week.
Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to comment? Yes, ma'am. Hi, Beth Riley, uh, 12 Hubbard Place. Um, congrats, Mary. Congrats, Tom. Um, couple quick things. Uh, what did I want to say? I wanted to say um, I know that school budget um, is happening. I believe you guys vote in April. Is that right? So I'm just here. May? May. Um, I'm going to try to go to the financial meetings and just hear a little bit more about the ins and outs of the budget, but I'm just here to say I hope it's fully funded. Um, there's a lot of uh, families that, um, you know, believe in public education here, so um, just hoping it's funded. And also the um, presentation earlier, I should have asked this, but as I'm sitting there, so Hanmer went from 0% um, vaccination to 8, and that was based on kindergarten uh, registration. So I'm just confused, and you, you might not know the answer. So 0% of kindergartners had a religious exemption, and then I, I'm just looking at numbers, so it, it's either like 30 kids at Hanmer who are, is the full 8% or it's like two to three kindergartners. Um, I don't know if we're just looking at kindergarten. I think we're just looking at kindergarten. Okay, so there's like two or three kindergartners with a religious exemption, which is also, you know, I, I find that alarming, but um, I, I was worried that it was 30 kids, so. Okay, thank you. And we're, we are going to follow up with um, not only the uh, health district but some staff here in town just to make sure that 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 number is correct that, okay you know it's not some wild number okay so. all right thank you yep thank you anybody else wishing to testify or wishing to uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh yes yeah um speak if not motion to adjourn i'll make a motion Second. Motion seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Abstain. Ayes have it. Thank you. Have a great night. Yeah.